afternoon. Again, from the MIT campus, Cambridge, Massachusetts, we welcome you to the third in our sequence of uh, MIT CAES ILP Distinguished Lectures. Uh, ILP is the Industrial Liaison Program here at MIT. CAES is the Center for Advanced Educational Services. For those, of, for those of you not here presently in the audience on the MIT campus, I'm delighted to report that it's early March. And truthfully speaking, crocuses and daffodils have shown their, uh, their sprouts. We won't discuss the weather any further than that. We are <laughs> delighted to have with us today uh, a true icon of, of MIT, somebody we're very proud is a member of our faculty, Institute Professor Millie Dresselhaus. Um, she took time out of her busy schedule to join us today. She's an award-winning solid-state physicist, and she's done lots of service in the scientific uh, area as well as being a, um, a world-distinguished uh, academician, researcher, and teacher. Uh, most recently, she adds to her long list of accomplishments. She's uh, been uh, named president-elect of the AAAS, the American Association for the Advancement of Science. And I guess she uh, joins this uh, pretty soon, within the next several months. She becomes officially president-elect. Rumor has it that if she's good at this job, she then becomes president in about a year. <laughs> and then after that, uh, chairman of the board of directors in 1998. Uh, Millie Dresselhaus is the ninth woman ever to be elected to be president of the AAAS, a real distinction. Her leadership within that association reflects a desire to foster a more encouraging uh, atmosphere for scientists and engineers in a time of uh, shrinking and constrained public uh, resources. <clears throat> uh, Professor Dresselhaus is a National Medal of Science winner whose uh, research has helped unlock many mysteries, particularly mysteries of carbon, one of the most fundamental of organic elements. And she studied various aspects of graphite and is author of a newly published comprehensive source book on fullerenes, known affectionately as buckyballs or bucky tubes. In fact, I hadn't heard of bucky tubes. I look forward to learning about them today. But she's going to show buckyballs today. And this is one of the symbols. This is, I guess, a smaller buckyball. She also has a larger one she's going to show us later today. That's supposed to be a joke, folks. <laughs> Uh, her current uh, research concerns uh, various uh, carbon-based systems, uh, including these buckyballs and nanotubes, low-dimensional uh, thermoelectricity, magnetism, high-temperature superconductivity. She's been at MIT even longer than I have, since 1960. Uh, we won't say when I entered, but it is shortly thereafter. And uh, uh, she's been a member of the electrical engineering department, physics department, and uh, perhaps most importantly, she likes to cite that with her husband, Dr. Jean F. Dresselhaus, who's a theoretical physicist, they have four children and three grandchildren at last count. Has the count changed since, uh, since we heard about this? OK. Millie Dresselhaus, thank you very much for joining us today. Well, I'm delighted to be here and participate in this uh, series. Uh, it's uh, really important for the professors to get out and talk to the public, including the industrial liaison members, and uh, tell you what we're doing. That's so exciting. Today, I'm going to talk about these little objects. This is an object that's uh, uh, probably quite familiar to most of you. Many people play soccer. Uh, so this is just a soccer ball. But it is also a regular truncated icosahedron. And if you imagine that at every six, every, if each of the 60 vertices of this object is a carbon atom, then we have the C60, the fullerene, the smallest um, fullerene that we have, most common of the fullerenes. And it's 7 tenths of a nanometer in size, which is very, very small. So that's what we're going to talk about. And um, I've entitled the talk here. Let's see if we can get the even works. Uh, New Frontiers of Carbon Research. Well, uh, I have been involved um, in carbon research I, now, as I figure it, since 1962, which is a long time. 
But the kind of thing I've been involved with is very, very different from what I'm going to talk about today, which is something new. And uh, I'd like to, set, uh, to cite my collaborators, uh, these people from around the world, uh, who uh, are recent collaborators on the Bucky Balls and Bucky Tubes. And I have a list, well, Jean Dresselhaus is at the, who was introduced by Professor Larson, plus a lot of graduate students who are currently and very recently involved with the Bucky Balls and related carbon uh, uh, objects that we've been studying in our lab. Let's take a moment and think about more traditional uh, carbon. We st in, in the field of uh, material science, we always start out with a phase diagram because that tells you, gives you some kind of scale of, of, uh, of what's going on. This particular phase diagram for carbon is a specially interesting one because it was the one that was used to first synthesize diamond, 1960. So this is a very long-standing phase diagram. And you, s you notice that the temperature scale here goes to very high temperature, 5,000 degrees Kelvin. So the scale for a carbon is the highest, the largest scale in temperature for any um, of the elements out there. And um, uh, the scale and pressure is also quite large. The center of the Earth in these units of kilobars of pressure, thousands of kilobars of pressure, so three megabars would be the center of the Earth. So. We're talking about high pressures. And here we have a uh, diamond somewhere in here uh, with the help of a catalyst was first synthesized uh, in 1960. In the laboratory it was a great discovery. Now I've spent my career working with this object here, which is the uh, uh, structure and properties of graphite, which is the ground state and the equilibrium situation for uh, carbon and it's the basis of, a, of an industry out there and all of that. Uh, what I mentioned on this phase diagram was this object here. I think maybe I'll try uh, pointing down to the board as well for the people in the uh, live audience, uh, that the uh, three-dimensional object is, is a wide gap semiconductor that's become more and more important as time goes on because of the very unusual properties that all of these carbon-based materials have. They have the highest thermal conductivity for graphite, the highest anisotropy for any material. So they're interesting both from a scientific standpoint as a base material, a reference material, something that we like to talk about in the classroom to teach students about. And then we go on from there to generate other materials related to these, often uh, having some uh, stimulus and um, uh, we get ideas from these kinds of, uh, of systems. Well, what I'm going to talk about today is based on carbon, based on the phase diagram, but has a little different twist. And this is what we've been concerned with for the last 10 years, and it has to do with a cluster. So if instead of having an infinite array, very large, 10 to the 20th or so atoms, uh, we have a very small number, then the equilibrium state is no longer the uh, uh, three-dimensional or the two-dimensional graphite that I mentioned, these layered sheets that are weakly hooked together, uh, uh, nor the, the diamond structure, but instead we have some other structures. And why is that? Well, the science behind it is that in this structure, you see we have all these edge sites. These edge sites have dangling bonds. Those give rise to additional energy and, and that's very unfavorable. So if we have just a few carbon atoms, the equilibrium state is not the state of the solid, but is something different. And uh, if we have a very small number of atoms, then they form into these kinds of structures, as I'm going to show in a little while, the Bucky balls. And uh, another possibility of the Bucky tubes, and I'm going to show those in the next view graph. So the low dimensional structures which have been recently discovered. So carbon's around have been studied by uh, people, chemists, and material scientists, and many folks for hundreds of years, but it's only in the last 10 years that anybody has gained any insight into these 
uh, uh, small dimensional forms of carbon. So here we have the Bucky ball, that's C60, which is I, this, this uh, soccer ball that you know. And the one dimensional form, which I'm going to explain later, which has, also has remarkable properties shown below, which is the tube. And that's a one dimensional tube. And you see that at the edges, the ends of the one end and the other end, we have half of one of these buckyballs. And in between, we have a cylinder of carbon atoms. And believe it or not, these things occur in nature. So uh, we'll find out about them. And those are the remarkable new structures. And I'm going to tell you some of the remarkable properties that these structures have. And at the end of the lecture, I'll try to rush through different things to give some time to show you that uh, uh, people in industry are probably also uh, uh, ha will have some interest in, this, in these kinds of materials because they have promise for all kinds of applications. So, uh, so here is carbon. And just to review what I've said, we have the ground state, which is graphite. That's the lowest energy state. Uh, that's the equilibrium phase. And very uh, uh, close in energy is diamond, with 20 millivolts above. And we know that it's almost stable. It's metastable, because if you have a diamond ring, it will last certainly a lifetime. And then, then for your grandchildren, you can be quite uh, uh, comfortable in, in uh, your heirloom properties. Uh, the uh, bucky balls, bucky tubes, are next in energy. And they're at about uh, 30 millivolts. Uh, so uh, now, why is that? They're almost like graphite that's rolled up in, in a tube. So the, the energy is almost the same. But when you make the Bucky balls, you see that they have much higher energy. And that's because of the curvature of the balls. So, uh, so that's the general picture. And so uh, with, with the very small number of atoms, we gain energy uh, by not having the edge uh, uh, unpaired uh, carbon atoms, but we have high curvature. OK, so let's now, I have a, my secretary in putting together the, the poster for me in my absence, because she thought it should be uh, uh, more accessible to the general public, uh, promised that I would tell you some uh, other fields of interest. So I said, well, let's have some art. And uh, here is a uh, um, Renaissance, pre-Renaissance painter. And uh, in his uh, spare time, he figured out how to assemble um, out of uh, planar objects uh, uh, one of these icosahedrons. So this is in the 15th century. And uh, Leonardo da Vinci. So Leonardo was a great uh, uh, talent in many fields. And one of the things that he did was he made a, a, a buckyball. And uh, there's mirror writing that tells you about the buckyball. So. And uh, in more recent times, we've had <laughs> Buckminster Fuller. Here's Buckminster Fuller and his buckyball. And that's a geodesic dome. And uh, uh, in fact, that's the reason that the buckyball got its name. It was named after Buckminster Fuller, and then for short, called buckyball. So that's the origin. And uh, you can see that how, the, how, how does the curvature comes, come about? Well, the curvature on a buckyball comes about by putting in these black pentagons. You probably never looked at the, at the soccer ball in this way. But the soccer ball consists of uh, 20 uh, hexa hexagon faces. Those are the white faces. And 12 pentagon faces. And the uh, pentagons, you can see every one of these units here with the five uh, uh, hexagons and the one pentagon in the middle. That's coranuline, which is a common uh, chemical molecule that has curvature. And the same curvature is, that is in coranuline is also present on, on this uh, cluster, this motif in C60. So if you put these together, uh, then you get the, the bucky ball. So uh, this uh, 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 object is of interest to all kinds of people. And I had a, a view graph here to tell you it's interdisciplinary. I'll just say something, but I won't have much time to go through all of these, but the architects are interested, Buckminster Fuller. And the astrophysicists are interested in this because a long time ago, uh, when before uh, the fullerenes were discovered, it was the astrophysicists that led to the buckyballs because of anomalies in the, in the spectra out there coming from the cosmos. 
And uh, the chemists are interested, sure, the chemists are interested. Why? Because here are the buckyballs, and we can append all kinds of molecules and appendages to them with all different properties. And um, uh, many people believe that there's a, a, a whole uh, science out there and, and technology uh, that's derived from uh, uh, fullerene-derived uh, molecules and, and solids. So you could see all kinds of phenyl groups and oxygens and whatever here. And I'll say more about that later. Another thing that you can uh, do with these uh, uh, fullerenes, you can shine light on them. And when you do that, they find each other and they bond in this way. So we still have the same C60 atom here and 60 carbon atoms there, but if they're properly aligned, then they come together uh, uh, in such a way, let me borrow Professor Larson's ball here. I don't have two the same size, but they bind together and they come together in the right orientation and they come closer together than actually the carbon carbon distance on the ball. And so they form this polymerized state. And I'll tell you some applications based on this. So this is very interesting that you can do this. And um, it's a headache of one, one hand. Uh, because sometimes you want to do optical experiments and you put on too much light and you fry the samples. But on the other hand, you could use this uh, uh, to make some uh, devices in the laboratory. Well, if you want to have tell, uh, find out a little bit more about Bucky balls and, and Bucky tubes, so we have a new book that's just come out from academic press and uh, it, it go, expands greatly on what uh, I'm going to tell you here. Well, uh, first I'll have some, uh, make a couple of comments that might uh, 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 engage the math mathematics people in the audience. Uh, no, mathematicians already know this, but this is good for kids. <laughs> uh, I'd like to explain um, a fundamental aspect of these buckyballs that uh, uh, was essential uh, and of great importance in, uh, in their first identification. How do we know we have buckyballs? And it was through a spectra, of course, of some sort that we found this out. So what, what, what should we look for? And uh, the Euler theorem that goes back to the seven, early 1700s uh, tells us about this. So what does the Euler theorem say? It says here that, it's given up, up here, it says the number of faces, F, plus the number of vertices, B, is equal to the number of edges per t plus two. And that's true for all, all closed polyhedra. Uh, now, if the, polyhedra ha if the polygons of the polyhedra happen to be pentagons and hexagons, P and H, and that all the faces, F, is equal to P plus H, so that gives us one equation. And then the number of edges, so, and that's shared. Up here you can see that every time you have an edge, like here, uh, it's shared by two. Uh, polygons. So 2E is equal to 5P plus 6H, because hexagon has six edges, of course. And, uh, and uh, uh, for the, uh, the uh, vertices, likewise, it, uh, each vertex is shared by three polygons, and the number of vertices for the pentagons is five, the hexagons is six. So we get then three equations and three unknowns. You solve them together, you get a remarkable result that uh, for the Fullerenes, any kind of fullerene composed of pentagons and hexagons, the number of pentagons is always 12. It, 12, are, uh, 12 pentagons are needed to take a flat sheet and to convert it into some closed object. That's what this theorem is saying. And if you have a bigger um, um, polygon, polyhedron, uh, the number, what happens in, in making the, the bigger size is just the addition of, of hexagons. But the number of pentagons remains the same. And every time you add a hexagon, you add two carbon atoms. So if you're looking for a signature of fullerenes, you look for objects that have an even number of carbon atoms. And in fact, that was the main um, item, main issue, main point that was used in the initial identification. So now I go back to some historical aspects about the identification of the uh, fullerenes. So this is 1984, which is one year before the first paper on the buckyballs. That comes in 1985. And um, uh, we at MIT here 
um, uh, had a, a PhD student who did a, an absolutely wonderful thesis on liquid carbon. And that was uh, not of great interest uh, to uh, the practical world of industry uh, because it's very hard to make liquid carbon. The melting point is 4,500 degrees Kelvin, and, uh, uh, and you, we could keep the uh, carbon liquid for only nanoseconds in time. So we had to make, do quick work to, to, uh, to find out about our liquid carbon. Uh, anyhow, uh, one of the things that we uh, were able to do was to figure out how much material uh, left the surface when we applied a certain amount of energy with a laser to the surface. So we had some idea of the energy balance, and we knew that the carbon had to come off in large chunks. But at the time that we did the work, uh, it was only known that carbon clusters existed in very small numbers like C2, C3, C5s, uh, even C10s were um, uh, not very common. Uh, uh, in er around that time, I visited Exxon and talked about our work, and they assured me that there were no higher fullerenes, uh, higher clusters of carbon. Well, uh, they pursued this work, whether it was because of our work or because of other people's work, because, as you know, in science, many things come together all at once. And they uh, had the courage to go and look for what happened at these higher mass uh, units. Here we see a plot of the number of species of a given type that are found. And on, on this axis, on the x-axis, how many carbon atoms are, are contained therein. And you could see that uh, there's a new series that starts up uh, somewhere uh, close to um, 40 carbon atoms. And uh, in this series, each peak is separated from each other peak by two carbon atoms. So that's a sign of what we were talking about. And there's a very large peak, much larger than its neighbors, around C60, and then a secondary peak over here around C70. Now, the people that, uh, 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 the Exxon group that published this paper, they were very excited for, about finding this series and also finding a series where the uh, peaks, the objects, were all separated by two. But they had no idea that this was related to anything new, that it had anything to do with closed shell molecules or fullerenes or anything. So they did a wonderful piece of work but they sort of missed the boat, and science is sometimes a little cruel that way. Uh, but the uh, um, group at uh, Rice University, they were doing a similar experiment, uh, and they were doing it for totally different reasons. They were trying to understand uh, why the spectrum from outer space uh, uh, that, that has to do with carbon is, is anomalous. They had all kinds of shifts of the spectra of the spectral species with respect to the spectra of carbon that we measure in the laboratory here on Earth. And what forms of carbon were out there in the cosmos? That was their, their big question. So uh, they were looking around for this, and they, they also found the C60, and they, uh, but they went at it a different way because they were looking for special species that were responsible, and they postulated this creature, and because it had the N plus 2 uh, sequence, they stuck their necks out, and they said it had something to do with a closed sh uh, shell molecule. They had very little evidence beyond that. It was very flimsy evidence. Well, um, the vibrational uh, spectra of the fullerenes are unique and somewhat wonderful. Why? We have 60 carbon atoms. So we have a huge number of degrees of freedom. 60 times 3 is 180. And even if you subtract the rotation and translation, it's still a huge number. So there are many, many modes. But the uh, high degeneracy, the high symmetry, makes these modes rather special. And only a very small number of these modes are either infrared or Raman active. So if you're doing experiments in the laboratory, the spectra are really quite simple. And uh, the upper trace here is the infrared mode. You see four lines, four big lines. And then below is the Raman spectra with 10 
uh, lines, and there are 32 silent modes. That's very, very unusual in molecular spectroscopy, and here we have this situation. There's another thing that's very nice about it is that because the system is so highly molecular, it is possible to look at higher order spectrum and actually get, do, do molecular spectroscopy to identify these higher order modes. Won't go into that today. I'd like to leave some time for applications. The electronic structure is also very unusual and could be understood by just thinking of electrons shared throughout the surface. There are 60 carbon atoms, one pi electron for each carbon atom. So we have 60 electrons to account for, 60 filled states for the molecule. And uh, if you just assign angular momentum uh, uh, quantum numbers to this, uh, series, you can account for the uh, angle, these, those are indicated by the pluses here, and the minuses are the unfilled states. So that the, uh, there's a band gap then, the 60 electrons go up to here, and this is unfilled, so we get a band gap between those. And uh, the simplest models already are able to give the rough electronic structure of this molecule. This is really quite remarkable. Uh, and it's kind of nice for teaching because we could give this as a, as a homework assignment to students and they get great gratification with uh, just a few weeks of introductory quantum mechanics. They're able to explain uh, something as complicated as what happens the on the elect to the electrons on a buckyball. Okay, so here is the molecular uh, picture and I, I just uh, uh, repeat that all the levels are filled up to this HOMO level, H sub U, uh, highest occupied molecular orbital. That, that's what a HOMO stands for. And then the LUMO, which is just the level above it, is the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. So a band gap forms between the two and we have then uh, a semiconductor with a band gap. And then when we make a solid, we crystallize it. We get a lot of buckyballs near each other. Then there's some weak interaction between them. Um, so you get some band states, and, but the band width is very, very small compared to the band gap. And that's totally different from what we're used to in semiconductor physics, like for example, silicon or gallium arsenide or something like that. So this is a kind of a, a different physics and uh, has changed, in fact, my way of of, of teaching and thinking about many things uh, for, for student purposes. Well, le let me say something about the condensed phase and, um, and the, uh, take the electronic structure from a different standpoint. Here is our molecule and it has 60 equivalent sites. Every site on the buckyball is just like every other site. So let's look at one of these, and you see that two of the sites, uh, two of the uh, bonds emanating from a carbon atom are in a pentagon. And they're single bonds, so one electron. And uh, this uh, uh, bond here is between two hexagons, so that's a double bond. So one plus one plus two is four, and that takes care of all the electrons for, s for an element in column four of the periodic table. Of course, carbon is an element in column four of the periodic table. So all the uh, bonds are satisfied. You expect this to be an insulator or semiconductor, and that's exactly what it is. But we can dope this semiconductor, just like we can dope silicon, except that we can dope this semiconductor in many ways. So um, uh, here are the three common ways. The first one is we can put something inside the icosahedron. Now well, that's really fun. And uh, that gives rise to something that we call an endohedral fullerene. Uh, right now, this is year 1996, approximately 10 years, a decade since the first discovery of the buckyball. We've known about buckyballs now for some time, and we know the existence of these endohedral fullerenes, but nobody has figured out how to produce these uh, endohedral fullerenes in mass quantities, in gram quantities, or all the same. So we have just very flimsy knowledge about this, and this is a, an emerging field. Maybe it'll be interesting. Maybe there'll be some interesting applications and properties. So we have uh, uh, many things to look forward to. As I progress in my talk today, I will point out uh, whole areas of, of, of 
lack of knowledge. And for young students, that's always the great thing, is uh, sometimes they come to the university, they think everything has been solved, and we have to tell them it's not so, that uh, just for all, every time we find out something, there are 10 new things that we find out that are also interesting to pursue. So this is a fundamental thing that we don't understand. This is uh, uh, an object, and you can imagine a whole uh, series of fullerenes with additional uh, hexagons, a little bit bigger in size. But in all of these, we could put something in the middle and make something that's endohedral with unusual properties. Well, we could take one of these atoms off the, uh, one car of the carbon atoms and substitute, say, a boron atom. So that's substitutional doping, as is done in silicon, to make N and P-type junctions. We could do that, and that's uh, another possibility. But the most interesting possibility is, is the third one here, which is called uh, exohedral doping, where we put um, uh, some guest species, like an alkali uh, atom, uh, uh, between the buckyballs. And uh, an alkali metal has one electron that's very weakly bound, and that electron will come off and will find its way to the buckyball. Buckyballs love to have extra electrons on them. They just love that. They love to be anions. And if you have a whole bunch of these anions, the electron can hop from one buckyball to the neighbor. You can do a hopping and then to the next one. And, and like that, you can get conduction. So the possibility of doping these buckyballs and making anions makes the possibility of making conducting buckyballs. Well, if you have conducting buckyballs, uh, maybe you can do even better than that. And that's what I'm trying to show on this view graph. So here we have uh, the introduction of uh, dopants. And so we have different structures here with different numbers of dopants. This is one uh, uh, per unit cell, and here are two and so forth. And uh, uh, one of them I colored in, in green here, so you could see that was special. And that is three uh, uh, of these uh, electrons. So we have a buckyball with three extra electrons, three anions. And uh, with that, we get the uh, conduction band. The conduction band uh, uh, can hold six electrons. Three electrons fills it in half, half fills it. And that gives the maximum conductivity so for that one, we in fact get metallic conductivity. So uh, the conductance, uh, the resistivity goes up with temperature. That's a sign of metallic conduction. And when we go down to low temperatures, what happens is voila, at some transition temperature, the uh, um, uh, resistivity goes to zero and we get a superconductor. So not only do the buckyballs uh, um, support metallic conduction, but they also support superconductivity. Uh, this is, this uh, uh, phenomenon was discovered in 1991. Unfortunately, it wasn't discovered in 1986. Uh, 1986 was when high TC was discovered, and buckyballs were discovered in 1985, and there was really no reason that, that uh, high TC superconductivity in these materials couldn't have been discovered at that time, because the um, uh, transition temperature, the highest transition temperature until the year 1986 was 23 degrees. And you can see there are many buckyballs that, uh, dope buckyballs that are, uh, have transition temperatures well in excess of that. The highest transition temperature in buckyballs so far is 40 degrees Kelvin. However, people that are in companies and want to make a living out of superconductors, this isn't the way to go because these are not stable superconductors. They're wonderful for a study for my students' thesis work, but they're never going to make it or not for some time unless somebody has a good idea and we can make a stable superconductor out of these. Now let me make a few comments about the Bucky tubes. The Bucky tubes um, are, are really uh, uh, interesting and kind of remarkable, and I'll just say, make a few comments about the, them to leave some time for the applications part of my talk. So we start out with a, a buckyball. Here's our buckyball. And let's imagine that we uh, take the, uh, um, we cut the buckyball normal to the axis that joins these two pentagons. Okay, so we just cut like that. And then we're going to add a whole row of carbon atoms around the belly. Okay. And the number of carbon atoms that you would need to, to go around the belly is exactly 10. If you look at the picture here, you'll see it's exactly 10. 
So that makes C70, and that's why C70 is, is stable, because it's just like C60 with 10 ex extra ring of carbon atoms. And now if we put two rings around, we get C80, and if we put many rings, eventually we get a tube. So that's what I'm going to show you. So here are the <coughs> tubes, examples of tubes. Now this is just uh, Gedanken. This is fantasy. Now, fantasy world, and I'll show you uh, reality in a bit. So we have, we can make the tubes normal to a five-fold axis, or we could also cut the uh, a buckyball normal to a, uh, an axis that goes through these hexagons. And that's a three-fold axis, another possibility. And then we, could, we have many more possibilities, but that's what I'm um, discussing. So uh, we have a half of a buckyball here, the other half is over there, and we join those two halves with a cylinder. Okay? And uh, similarly for the bottom. Now let me show you a little bit better about that. So here is the honeycomb lattice for graphite. Single layer, just one layer of carbon atoms. And you see over here I have zigzag edge. And what I do to form the cylinder is I fold this over to make them fit perfectly one onto the other. And you could see that they would fit perfectly. And what we have over at the edge is something with steps, and that those steps is what we call the armchair that's shown over here. So that's our armchair. That's that. And if we instead take this sheet, and we fold it this way, so we make the armchair edge superimpose like this. Then what's left at the, uh, to join up to the uh, hemisphere of the buckyball is this um, uh, zigzag edge, and that gives us this kind of a buckyball, bucky tube. So that's how we get these in, in simplicity. I'm going to leave this out in case I want it again. Why uh, people might be interested in these Bucky tubes is the remarkable properties that the carbon fibers have to which the Bucky tubes are related. Uh, as you know, carbon fiber is the strongest and stiffest material that we have out there. Here is steel for comparison. And um, steel is usually considered as something quite strong that if you pull on it, it won't break very easily. Or if you bend it like this, this is mod what modulus means, it won't, um, it doesn't bend very well, so it has a high modulus. But relative to steel, uh, bucky, bu uh, uh, carbon fibers are very much better. And the, the question is, if you uh, uh, have a bucky tube, uh, how would that compare? And we thought that bucky tubes might be the um, embellishment, the, uh, an example, a prototype of um, theore uh, theoretical carbon fiber. And, and in fact, that, that's true. But it has some remarkable properties, of course, now that we've been studying bucky tubes that we hadn't expected. Like science is always that way. It has a few surprises. Well, uh, very shortly after people started thinking about these uh, tubes, uh, there was a report, literature, Nature magazine, and here are some tubes, uh, 67 angstroms, so a, a little bit less than 7 nanometers in diameter, and inner diameters for this tube, this last tube here, that's the smallest inner uh, diameter of, uh, of a little over 2 nanometers, so very small tubes, and the length is a micron, so they have a very large aspect ratio, so very interesting. Now, the theoretical work that was done in our lab here at MIT and around the world is almost all for single wall tubes because those are the easiest to discuss. So um, there was some impetus to the experimental community to come up with single wall nanotubes. And sure enough, within a year, they came up with them. So here are single wall nanotubes, and they're made with catalysts, transition metals. And uh, the bar chart that's uh, on the bottom of this view graph um, is very uh, interesting because it shows for the single wall nanotubes, the largest diameters are very small. They're less than two nanometers, or you know, there are hard, hardly any in this beyond two nanometers. 
Uh, the maximum is about one na nanometer, that's the most probable size, and the smallest size is seven angstroms, or seven-tenth of a nanometer. What's seven-tenth of a nanometer? This thing. So what it tells you is that you have to cap these, t these uh, tubes with something, otherwise you have um, uh, exposed carbon atoms on unsatisfied bonds, so that's not very favorable. Uh, and the smallest uh, ball that you can make, uh, fullerene you can make, uh, with pentagons that are not on top of one, one another, that is separated pentagons, is, the is a C60. So this is a very special molecule. It has special properties and uh, also defines the smallest uh, uh, nanotube that you can make. So, so that was very uh, interesting uh, discovery. In fact, uh, science is very interesting. Years ago, 20 years ago, because this view graph shows dates of publications that are 20 years old, uh, people uh, were studying carbon fibers, very, a very small diameter. They call them carbon fibers. They're really nanotubes, but they call them carbon fibers because the method of preparation is the same as what we use today. So uh, they are carbon fibers. And even the question was asked, what is the smallest diameter that you could ever have for a carbon fiber? And that was Professor Kubo. Those people that are in physics will recognize the name, very famous uh, theoretical uh, physicist of this century. And he wanted to know, what's the if you have these things, what's the smallest diameter you can have? Of course, at that time, nobody understood the connection between the tubes and the fullerenes. So there was no answer to that question. So that's what we really waited for for the, all this time, is to understand in a more microscopic way what these smallest tubes are. Well, I'm going to tell you a little bit in very short about the remarkable electrical properties. This gets into a, a little bit of math, and uh, uh, maybe the most interesting part is what the end result is. We can, in fact, make a whole family of nanotubes because all that's important is we have to have some way of rolling up the sheet so that the two sides can match. There are many ways to do that. And this picture on top shows the different ways. So if I go from uh, uh, O to A uh, here in the, in the view graph, so pick, uh, point O and point A are exactly identical. They're the same point from a crystallographic standpoint. And if I uh, uh, then, that's an arbitrary uh, uh, lattice point. There are many like, like point A. That's not unique. And if I now drop normals like OB or AB prime to the line OA, then I have the lines that I have to join. So that shows you that there's a whole family of these tubes I can make. They have a different property in that they're chiral. That is the the uh, atoms w wind around in spirals as they go up the, the tube, rather than just circles for the simple cases that I mentioned before. But there's a whole family of the, them. And what, what's most remarkable about, remarkable about these tubes is that one-third of them are metallic, and two-thirds of them are semiconducting, depending on geometry. So that's a very interesting thing. And I'll give you a very brief summary about why that comes about, but I can't give a very simple uh, display of that. The argument is based on the following concept, that when we have the tube, we make the tube like this, and we have uh, a finite number of carbon atoms that go around the uh, circumference. The number of wave vectors that we would have assigned to the system in reciprocal space, for those people that understand those things, is equal to the number of atoms. And uh, if what we want to do is, as we go around the cylinder, we want our electronic wave function to be continuous as we go around. So going from this sheet to the next sheet, we should have continuity. So we match the boundary conditions. And that imposes certain restrictions on what the dispersion relations can be. What it all boils down to in the end is, and I guess that I need 
my next picture to show that. Is here are dispersion relations with nine atoms across the belly of the tube. This is two, now imagine, you know, belly, nine atoms. And then the one on the right has 10 atoms. That seems almost very little difference, right? But when you look at it, for the nine atom case, there's a band degeneracy, that is the conduction and valence states, the occupied states and the empty states are degenerate. So with almost no additional energy, an electron can conduct. So we have metallic system, and, which is just like graphite, which is a good, rather good conductor. In this case here, a band gap for, for forms. And uh, so uh, uh, what's the difference? Well, the difference has to do with the number of wave vectors, which is totally a geometric effect. Uh, on this diagram, we go, this is now reciprocal space, and that we have uh, 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 vertical lines for all the wave vectors. And you'll see that there are nine such lines that are drawn here. The distance between uh, M and the edge, which is also a gamma point, which I should have mentioned, uh, noted on the, on the view graph, is one-third. So if the number of atoms is divisible by three, we get a metallic state, because then we'll always have a wave vector that goes through this M point, which is our degeneracy point. But if we have 10, 10 is not divisible by three, there's no wave vector going through that point, and therefore we have a semiconductor. This is a quantum mechanical phenomenon, but it has remarkable properties and uh, effects on these uh, uh, tubes. Well, uh, it's wonderful to talk about basic science in this way, but uh, can we uh, uh, demonstrate this in the laboratory? And the answer is yes. And um, here is 1994, so it took a little while to do this difficult experiment. And this is done with scanning tunneling microscopy and scanning tunneling uh, spectroscopy. And we see here the IV characteristics, current versus voltage. And uh, for a set of different nanotubes. They had a whole bunch of nanotubes, and there are three of them that are shown in this picture for illustration. Uh, uh, nanotube number one. The IV characteristic goes through the origin here straight. So this is an omic one, so that's metallic. And two and three have a step. They don't go through straight. They have a kink. And the size of, from the size of this kink, you can figure out what the band gap uh, uh, is supposed to be. And um, with the scanning tunneling microscope, they can also, on the same tubule, nanotube, measure what the diameter is. So they measure the electrical properties and the geometrical properties all at once. That's really remarkable that you could do that. Something that's uh, as small as this, one or two nanometers in diameter. And what they come up with is this result, that the energy gap for the semiconducting tubules all collected together goes as the reciprocal of the diameter, which is in that, that functional form is what you come up with also theoretically. The experiment did it first, so they weren't influenced by the, by the theory. Well, I could tell you many more remarkable things about the nanotubes and the fullerenes, but I thought I would say a little bit about the practical applications in my remaining, I think I have five or six minutes. Um, let me uh, uh, say a couple of things about the nanotubes. If you could have nanotubes that are uh, conducting and, uh, and insulating, so M is metallic and I is insulating. You could imagine you have a cable here, a cable memory device. You put it in some kind of shell so they, you, you can preserve what, what information you've put in. Uh, so here is uh, a junction, metal semiconductor junction, et cetera. So you could imagine different structures. Now this is all, nobody's made these. This is just Gedanken experiments. Right now we're only at this stage of, um, of measuring uh, with uh, scanning tunneling spectroscopy. There is some uh, measurement already of transport properties of, of these uh, objects uh, on a single nanotube, which is quite remarkable. Putting, so here's a single nanotube, um, 20 nanometers in diameter. That's the best they've done so far. Four leads, two on each side. And of course, they get metallic conduction. And 
It's about the right magnitude. So we're making progress. It's an interesting thing because uh, usually in uh, semiconductor physics, as some people in the audience uh, work on, we deal with planar structures. And here the um, metallic system is a cylinder, so a reentrance cylinder. So it has some different physical properties. I'd like to uh, mention some other applications because people, uh, industry is more interested in new materials if they uh, have some promise of doing some new things. Let me talk about uh, several applications. There, in our book, we have many applications. We have maybe a hundred applications, but here are, uh, and we talk about maybe twenty of them in some detail. But I, I've, I've selected a few for for today. Phototransformation. What what is that good for? Phototransformation is the uh, foundation of photoresists. Here we have um, objects that are very small. They're less than one nanometer. They're all the same. We can make a whole bottle of buckyballs, pretty cheap now, that are all the same. And uh, if you put light on, you hook them together. When you hook them together, they're no, mo no longer soluble. So there's a different solubility between the polymerized uh, buckyballs and those that exist in the monomer form that haven't been exposed to light. So you can make a patterned system. And uh, for some applications, this could be quite interesting. The uh, use of uh, uh, NO uh, uh, in the uh, process makes this quite efficient and uh, makes it um, compatible and uh, um, interesting in terms of efficiency compared to presently used photoresists. So I imagine there could be some interest in the applications. Well, how does this all work? Um, uh, this shows the temperature range in which the phototransformation works well. Uh, you have to be at temperature that's uh, high enough so that the buckyballs will move around a bit so that they find each other in the right orientation, but not so energetic that they have energy to break the bond. So that's the temperature range where this thing works. And they, th you can form bonds between these and others. You can have many bonds. You can have uh, uh, a polymer, and that's what's shown here, number of bonds. And you can uh, detect this remotely with uh, some kind of spectroscopic tool like Raman or infrared spectroscopy, where the, because the, uh, the carbon atoms uh, that come together are small, uh, the distance between the carbon and carbon bond is smaller for the phototransformed ones than it is otherwise. There's a different signature, there's a different vibrational frequency, so you can detect them remotely. So you have an easy way to know when you, your system is working or if it's not working, uh, then you better fix it. Uh, let me give you another example of, of where buckyballs, one of, I like this example. Uh, silicon carbide. What's silicon carbide good for? It's a wide ga uh, uh, band gap semiconductor. Th three electron volts is the band gap. It has some excellent properties in terms of stability, has good mobility, therm thermal conductivity, et cetera. But it's almost never used because it cannot be patterned and it cannot be controlled very well. So you can't etch it, you can't pattern it, um, and there aren't very good techniques for growing nice um, uh, uh, single crystal films. But with buckyballs, you can do, do that. Now why? On this picture here, I show you a transistor, a textbook transistor, in fact. So we have silicon, that's the, uh, the dark area, and the hatched area, uh, uh, silicon dioxide is, is the, uh, um, the darkened area, and the hatched area is silicon, that's your transistor. Silicon has the property of having many dangling bonds, and that's, that's the, the, the nature of, of, of silicon the silicon surface. Those dangling bonds engage the buckyballs readily. So buckyballs will stick very nicely to silicon. Silicon dioxide doesn't have dangling bonds, so the buckyballs do not stick to the silicon. So if you uh, uh, have that transistor, for example, and you have a, a rain of buckyballs coming on the surface, uh, they'll stick only where the transistor place is, 
and where the silicon dioxide is, they, they won't stick at all. So uh, like that, you can build up a surface. If you heat up the, uh, the system, the silicon and the carbon from the uh, buckyball will react and make silicon carbide, and you get a film. And the film is crystalline, as I'll show you in the next uh, view graph. So uh, this is a way, and it's been done now in quite a number of labs around the world. All right now is uh, in universities. There's no practical device yet, but I think there could be. And uh, this shows you that it's single crystal, and uh, the, here are the reflections for cubic um, uh, silicon carbide. It has uh, very nice frictional properties, so people that are in MEMS and micro um, mechanical systems, they might find this a good um, uh, system. And uh, you can prepare films up to 2,000 angstroms, which is about as thick as you want to go for device applications. And there may be other things that you can do with the buckyballs. This is one example of, that has already been um, done. As I mentioned earlier, there are many chemistry applications. And um, at least in some of the chemistry labs around the world, people are, are working on these. There are patents out there, uh, new materials is about, about half the patents in the patent literature on buckyballs are for new materials based on, on buckyballs. New materials derived because of interaction with buckyballs. So chemistry is a large part of this. And here you see the polymers. Uh, you see um, uh, halogens, uh, um, uh, oxygen, uh, and different, uh, uh, different uh, species that you can attach to these and make some interesting um, uh, systems. I thought I would show in my last view graph something that's uh, stylish nowadays. In biochemistry, people are, are working hard to try to find some way of uh, reducing the activity of the HIV um, virus. And so the, this picture here is the HIV virus. And you see there's a cleft in there. The cleft in the virus is exactly the right size of the buckyball. So if you, inter if you send buckyballs raining on the um, uh, HIV virus, uh, some will attach in this place, and then they uh, will destabilize the virus, and it won't uh, multiply anymore. So this started out as a theory uh, uh, paper, and then people tried it in the laboratory, and they've had some laboratory tests with mice, and it, and it even works. So. Uh, there may be some possibilities in biochemistry for this uh, remarkable molecule. So uh, I think my time is just about over, uh, and uh, this is a good time to stop and, and ask for questions. Who wants the first one? Yes. Yeah, you know, sort of three questions, two may be the same. Well, let's try with one, and then we'll give somebody else a chance. All right. Um, well, all right. You mentioned, you mentioned methyl semiconductor transitions. You didn't mention the word insulator. Can any of the Bucky structures be insulators? Well, <clears throat> they could be insulators, but uh, one of the problems with, with Bucky balls that makes well, if you have a buckyball surface that's out exposed to oxygen, it will have a very high resistivity. If the buckyballs are very clean and pure, then the resistivity goes down. So uh, for the practical device, if you want to have a, a good insulator, I suppose you could say that a surface will be insulating. I wouldn't uh, um, uh, be outselling this for my best world's best insulator. But in principle, it has a band gap of 1.5 EV, a breakdown voltage. I'm not sure that we know exactly what it is. It's not very high. So the superconductors are unstable? No, no. The reason why the superconductors, no, that, that isn't related to that. The reason why the superconductors are unstable is, is that every single uh, dopant that has been successfully used to make a superconducting uh, uh, fullerene uh, um, is chemically unstable. That is, you leave it in the atmosphere, the uh, uh, reagent that you've added
to, like you have an alkali metal, you add that to a fullerene, you leave it out in the air, the alkali metal leaves. It oxidizes immediately upon exposure to air. So that's, that's not, to keep the superconductors superconducting, you have to encapsulate them, and that makes the material not very practical for commercial applications. That's a, quite a different story from the uh, dielectric properties. Um, another question. Yes. You mentioned there was a lot of patent activity with regard to uh, designer molecules, I guess, yeah. with buckyballs There's combined with other things. Could you care to comment a little bit more about that? What, uh, what kinds of uh, what kinds of processes are being patented, and does this, does well, this interfere with academic research in any sense? Maybe. Uh, uh, it, it, it interferes somewhat with the literature because some of the best ideas probably are um, uh, under patent, and so they, they're not published in the open literature immediately. So uh, that's, that's one thing, especially in the area of chemistry and new materials. Uh, some, some of the air, uh, uh, active areas are uh, uh, diamond synthesis. There are quite a number of patents. Out, uh, that is, um, here, this is a curved surface. Uh, um, you, the uh, uh, diamond differs from graphite. Graphite's planar. Diamond has SPQ bonding. So when you get a curved surface, you have some admixture of SPQ bonding. So by having this curvature built in here, it is thought that it would promote in some way um, uh, formation of diamond. And in fact, it does. And people have used this as um, a source for clusters, carbon clusters that are used in, in the diamond synth film synthesis. And it works very well and produces a kind of diamond that has very small grains, which means that you have a, a, a nanocrystalline size so that the surface uh, 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 doesn't have so much friction as the usual diamond surface that uh, is produced by present day techniques. So for some applications, you imagine a stylus going along a surface uh, uh, to have non-bumpy surfaces uh, advantage. So there's some people that are pushing that, um, improving the technology, trying to make it competitive in cost and reproducibility. So that's, um, I don't know how close to commercialization it is, but there's a lot of activity worldwide in that area. But there are, there are just many, uh, 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 for sensors and just many different things, nanotechnology. There's just a whole range of different applications. I have a listing of all the different patent areas in the book, if you're interested. Yes. Do, do you say something about uh, whether whether uh, any of these structures are fabric can be fabricated, or whether it's known that whether they can be fabricated biologically, and maybe speculate as to, I, I, as far as I'm aware, the answer to that is no, and, and speculate maybe why that's true. Why why haven't they arisen as structures that we see uh, in, in the biological world? Well, uh, uh, in the biological world, we see some structures related to the, to buckyballs, but we don't see buckyballs themselves. In fact, in, in astrophysics, people have now been searching for, now that they know the existence of, of buckyballs, they have been searching religiously to try to uh, re uh, reconcile the various spectra that we find here on Earth from these whole menagerie of, of, of fullerenes. And not, there is no correspondence yet. There's no verification that the anomalies in space are really associated with these objects. So in some sense, the um, uh, unknown still remains with us. This has been um, an active research area since 1920, some time like that. So it's many, many years. And uh, when buckyballs were discovered, they thought, aha, uh -huh, voila, we have the answer. But it's still not um, uh, certain that there's much connection between the anomalies in astrophysics and astrophysics and the balls. Now, getting back to the biological systems, which is what you asked about, there are many viruses that have uh, this kind of shape, but they're not only 
full of, they're not only carbon, they have other things. Study of these is interesting for the biologists because of the um, similarities of the structure and perhaps they can learn something. But this itself is not known to exist. But, but it is believed that this is benign in the body. That is, if you swallow some buckyballs, it's not going to kill you. Uh, there has been research, and this is important for researchers to know that you work on some new chemical that it's, uh, it's, um, it's okay. Uh, the tubes are another matter. If you look in uh, biological um, uh, works, uh, there is a lot of evidence for very narrow tubules. And what they have seems somehow to be related, although nobody has yet made the connection. But there seems to be some correspondence to me, anyway, looking at the two kinds of, of pictures of what I know that we have in, in the, in the uh, inanimate world and what I see on my biology friends. There are a lot of tubes that, that join different things and, uh, and functions and, and so forth. Um, if we understand these nanotubes, I think we could be quite helpful to the biology people that are trying to understand these structures that exist in, in, in living systems. But they're not only carbon. Is it, are, are very long nanotubes, say, like it's possible to make a 20 foot long nanotube? No one, of course, has done it, but I'm wondering, is there any theoretical reason why we couldn't have reels of the stuff, kilometers, used for something interesting? Well, uh, with carbon fibers, which are a little bit larger in size, um, um, you can make meter long lengths, I think, has been uh, for something that's about um, uh, one micron in diameter. That, that has been demonstrated. Uh, with the nanotubes, it, nobody has been working on that particular aspect. The main thing with the nanotubes is the lack of control, is that one knows how to make nanotubes. You can always make nanotubes reliably, but you take what you get. And you don't have real control about what the diameter is going to be, what is the length, what is the chirality. And uh, this is future research. Uh, question. <coughs> how about the uh, optical properties? <coughs> The optical properties are, are quite remarkable and interesting and uh, have real possibilities for applications. Why is that? It has to do with the fact that uh, you have molecular solid, that's number one. The valence and conduction band have the same parity, and because of that, uh, um, dipole transitions are forbidden, okay? so that. At the absorption edge, you have to do things to make that transition take place. So that means that you can control it. How, if you can, can, by some means, get electrons in the excited state, then they can more easily make transitions to higher states because then you can have allowed transitions. Well, what that al uh, allows you to, to uh, then achieve is a metastable um, uh, state for the uh, lowest state in the conduction band. So that becomes metastable and therefore becomes a way to get saturation in, uh, in absorption. So uh, that is the basis of, um, of an optical limiter, which works much better than any other material in terms of efficiency in, at the appropriate wavelength. So that's one um, um, application that probably will find um, some use in soon, just because it works so well. But there are many other optical properties. Most of the optical properties are not, not so well understood because uh, the polymerization effect that I mentioned uh, has been in the way of serious studies. What people uh, have, haven't realized that, that when they put light on the samples, they're making um, phototransform material. So which, which lowers the symmetry and therefore changes many things. So um, uh, once you understand that, you can work around and work at a higher temperature or do something to break those polymerized bonds. And, and um, you know, when that takes place, then we'll know much more about the optical properties in detail.
that's the one area that's not well understood right now about the, the buckyballs. <laughs>